Hello, good afternoon. It is a tremendous pleasure to be here at the 27th Annual Surface Navy Association Symposium. For more than a quarter of a decade, you all know better than I, SNA has been promoting discussion, debate, dialogue, and camaraderie within the Surface Navy community. To frame that just a bit, SNA held its first board meeting in January of 1987, right after the movie Top Gun, and the Heard Everywhere, Heard All the Time, Kenny Loggins hit Danger Zone was out in 1986. The surface community decided to go on the offensive then, of course, this was also about the same time we were bringing game changers online in earnest, like Aegis, and distributing offensive capability across the surface force, like the Tomahawk weapon system, converting frigate-armed Spruance-class destroyers to the ABL and VLS backbone for long-range strike, and putting rigor in our harpoon tactics, as well as adding widely to the reach and situational awareness of our surface ships by extending flight decks and distributing the SH-60B across our destroyers and guided missile frigates. The surface line community was pretty savvy then, as it is now. I'm grateful for surface war warriors like Barry McCullough, the president of SF SNA, Admiral Dave Hart, and Bill Erickson, who I met on the way in today, and the many chapter presidents across the planet for working to sustain this important association, continuing the dialogue and debate, and ensuring the camaraderie so important to a professional organization, a community. Thank you, all of you, for putting this tremendous event together. It's great to be here. <clears throat> In keeping with our theme this week, job one for me was to go on the offensive as well. I proceeded directly over to the membership table where I had to correct my deficient status. <laughs> now that said, I paid for an additional membership for a junior officer as well. So if there's a young surface warfare officer, a lieutenant or lieutenant commander, or even some enlisted out there on the fence, or just shy the funds for a membership this year, for the next three years actually, be the first to the table. You can hook my extra check, it's sitting there blank, uh, actually, I take that back. It says 50 bucks on it with my name. <clears throat> and I'll take credit for distributing these fires as well. So there better be a lieutenant or lieutenant commander that gets up and runs out of this room because if you're going to sit here for 30 minutes and listen to this, it's probably a better deal up there. So, all right. As you look around the exhibits, the sponsors and the overall attendance by civilian, military, and industry leaders of all ages, you can't help but be impressed by the opportunity that this symposium provides. Last week, at the Air Lant change of command, I can say that, in the hangar of George H.W. Bush, also I can say that, I reflected on the teamwork and effort that it took to put together such a tremendous warship and symbol of American pride and know-how. And seeing the exhibit booths here today, the next set of warfighting innovations in America I am reminded that I have been the benefactor of an incredibly talented industry, civilian, military team that has assembled, tested, conceived, and delivered together the great ships and weapon systems in our fleet. In my history, I say that since the beginning of my service. Thank you, all of you, for what you do to help us sail over the horizon into harm's way in defense of this great nation. Never think. We don't appreciate it, those of us in uniform. Now, as we kick off 2015, there will be no shortage of challenging issues needing deliberation, analysis, and action. Reaching back to just my own experience as the Sixth Fleet Commander just a several weeks ago, I am struck by the many and varying challenges that unfolded in 2014. The neutralization of Syrian chemical weapon stockpiles at sea, the rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, the recapture and repatriation of the motor vessel Morning Glory to Libya, the Russian invasion and seizure of the Crimea, and the subsequent activity in eastern Ukraine, as well as the outbreak of Ebola in western Africa. These just highlight the breadth and depth of security issues that are part of the global scenery these days. You will not be surprised to hear that the Navy and almost always your surface navy, played a significant role in many of these events, responding to the nation's call. 
In September alone, the USS Philippine Sea and the USS Arleigh Burke demonstrated their readiness for action, launching 47 Tomahawks against terror targets in Iraq and Syria. I'd like to underscore their combat performance against ISIS and Kobani extremists, as well as that of George H.W. Bush and Carrier Air Wing 8, to say that we are all warriors first. I think Admiral Roden hit that point hard earlier today. I am with him every step of the way. I frequently remind my commanders and my commanding officers that our first order of business for a forward force is to be ready, to keep our ships prepared for action and our officers and crews willingly disposed to fight and win in combat. We can never forget that. Of course, that's the right hand edge of the spectrum. Somewhere to the left is the myriad of missions we also execute as a result of our forward posture. We don't just deliver effects in terms of warheads downrange. The surface Navy delivers effects across all domains as well, including the diplomatic, hell, even the scientific. Task Force 64, led by another SWO, Captain Richard Drummerhauser, also demonstrated the versatility and depth of surface warfare, excuse me, surface warfare officers, leading the tactical organization that conducted the hydrolysis of Syrian chemical weapon precursor agents last year. Rich led the team of sailors, civilian mariners, and U.S. Army Corps of Engineer chemical engineers, excuse me, not Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army chemical engineers in motor vessel Cape Ray to conduct the first ever neutralization of chemical weapon agents ever attempted at sea. In addition to leading the ships, yes, the submarines, the aircraft, the security, and other expeditionary elements from 11 nations at the tactical level, Rich helped identify solutions in chemical agent processing challenges at sea. These were challenges that had never before presented themselves in a landward environment, in an ashore operation. In all, this was a major sustained operation with numerous equities at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels in the interagency, at the United Nations, with a multitude of allies and foreign organizations, and with commercial industry. It had numerous tactical challenges as well, and those are just the equities I can think of off the top of my head. As with all missions, there was only one acceptable outcome to this tasking, mission success. I put a SWO in charge to ensure that outcome. These are just two of the examples of a, excuse me, two examples of the benefits of a forward deployed force. As it was in the 80s, in 1987, when SNA was conceived, and as it is now, <clears throat> I am a big believer in a Navy that is forward. As the CNO says, presence is our mandate and we will deliver. Whether we highlight these examples, our operations today, like the Carl Vinson and Carrier Air Wing 17 deployed today, conducting Operation Inherent Resolve in Syria and Iraq, and with USS Sampson and USS Fort Worth supporting the response to the Air Asia flight mishap, and the 98 ships deployed around the world today, the U.S. Navy is forward deterring aggression, reassuring allies, responding to crisis, and yes, conducting combat operations day in and day out. While there was much more to my 2014 as Com 6 Fleet, now I am at U.S. Fleet Forces Command. And it is clear to me what the business of Fleet Forces Command is, warfighting and readiness. I will say it again, warfighting and readiness. Why do I say that? It stems from the words that define the mission of the Navy, codified in law, if you didn't know, that the mission of the Navy is to be able to conduct prompt, sustained combat operations at sea. And we do so always in defense of this nation and its interests. That clearly gives me my Fleet Forces Command agenda. After all, combat operations at sea is warfighting, and putting the prompt and sustained in that warfighting is about readiness. I am not a commander troubled by a ready for what equivocation. Based on what I just said, the examples I just discussed in Sixth Fleet alone, it is clear to me that my job, the job of Fleet Forces Command, is to make the fleet ready to fight and win both today and tomorrow. The only acceptable metric 
is the one I mentioned earlier, mission success. And for Fleet Forces Command, that means a fleet that will succeed in combat. I am pretty comforted by the performance of the fleet to date. Certainly my experience of Sixth Fleet that I just articulated is an indicator that we are preparing the fleet in a way that delivers mission success. In other words, Fleet Forces Command has been effective under a number of commanders to date. But I will tell you unabashedly, I am fortunate to follow Shortney. He has given the fleet the organizing principles like OFRP, like the concept of the Warfare Development Centers, as well as the analytical underpinning that is the readiness kill chain. And he involved, excuse me, he evolved the fleet headquarter processes and our partnership with the Pacific Fleet to enable us to be ready for tomorrow's fight. So as Fleet Forces Command's first order of business, I intend to see these initiatives through. As we go forward, it is up to the Fleet Forces Command to build on this foundation and our work is cut out for us. Today's fight is evolving rapidly. Some nation states, America's competitors and potential adversaries flexing their muscles abroad, are matching vastly improved technologies in the air, on and under the sea, space and cyberspace, and yes, in the information domain, with the ambiguous methods, the false narratives, and the brutality of the worst non-state actors, like terrorists. At the same time, events like last week's terror attacks in Paris, the recent atrocities committed by Boko Haram, and the cyber hacking of DOD websites just yesterday, serve as notice of the brutality and persistence of the worst of the non-state actors, and that they aspire to match their methods with high technology, both on the web, in the cyber domain, and with the proliferation of more traditional military technologies, whether stolen, bought, seized, proliferated, or hijacked. This new hybrid way of warfare is out there. It is our here and now and requires us to prepare the fleet to fight and win in this evolved battle space, to employ the force, to employ the force in denied or contested environments of all kinds, on, under, and above the sea, in space and cyberspace, indeed, even in the information domain, and to be able to deliver the capabilities the nation demands, old and new alike, wherever and whenever needed. So I take this as my next order of business, to ready the force for employment in this battle space, the very fights the Navy will see in its immediate future. What does this mean? <clears throat> in our recent history, the Gulf Wars, in the Adriatic, in the North Arabian Sea, in action against Libya, and in numerous contingencies, we operated in a fashion that leveraged significant technical capabilities, our precision weaponry, our situational awareness, and our superior command and control systems, amongst other technologies. With the confidence that should we be challenged, we would defeat that challenge with the push of a button. There's a t-shirt on Sailor Bob. It says, stay calm and roll fizz green. Right? That's the technology we've been relying on. Well, given all we've observed in the Western Pacific, in the Persian Gulf, in the eastern Mediterranean and along the periphery of the Black Sea, it is clear that technology cannot be solely relied upon to provide our tactical advantage. Simply put, technology cannot be our only tactic in the battle space. Now, the theme of the conference, lethality. Lethality, lethality isn't just about speed, range, and explosive weight. Our discussions about lethality must include culture and approach. Distributing our lethality isn't just a catchphrase in which to set this agenda. This is the requirement in the evolved battle space. Here's how I see it. Distributed lethality means three things. It's going to require us to distribute our sensors and fires, to distribute our maneuver in multiple domains, and to distribute our costs. Let's talk about these. First, we must distribute our sensors and fires to extend our vision and our punching reach. And I'm not just talking about power projection fires like Tomahawk. We need distributed kinetic 
and non-kinetic fires that can bring about offensive effects to control the seat at a time and place of our choosing. The first part of this isn't necessarily new. We understand the need for distributed sensors. In fact, TR Strike Group completes workups next month and deploys as the first NIFCA-capable strike group in March. By netting the strike group's distributed airborne and surface sensors together, NIFCA enables all platforms to contribute to a precise, common fire control network. It also means that not every platform has to possess the most exquisite sensor or the longest ranged, most capable missile. Indeed, every platform in the network benefits from the diversity and capability of the whole and enables delivery of offensive effects beyond those of our adversaries. We do need to close the ASUW gap in our surface forces by providing our surface combatants with the next over-the-horizon surface-to-surface missile. Railgun and directed energy weapons are our next order of business as well. All of these will greatly improve our ability to control the sea and deliver the requisite effects in the battle space, in the contested or denied battle space. But we have to include the sensors too. It's not just the fires. We cannot forget about the airborne extensions of our surface weapon systems, like the MH-60, like the Fire Scout Charlie, and the E-2D, and we need to continue to push for adva other advanced airborne sensors like the AISA radar. These provide robust tactical awareness to our surface platforms. Next. Next, we have to be able to distribute our maneuver. We need to go on the offense in terms of adapting our tactical mindset. I'm not questioning what's been done previously. We've simply been operating within the context of the technological advances, excuse me, advantages, and the environments we've enjoyed over the past two decades. Now we need to take a page out of the 80s playbook and distribute our maneuver. Maneuvering with operational and tactical purpose, both physically and or in cyberspace, to shape the battle space in a way that denies our adversary the situational awareness and targeting he requires so that we retain the advantage in a contested or denied environment. In terms of the kill chain, I like to talk about things way left the launch before our adversary can get to a decision to attack. As I observed in the Mediterranean, we need to get further left in the adversary's kill chain and their kill networks to introduce ambiguity and disrupt the adversary's understanding about the distribution and formation and posture and position of our force. The proper tactics of our surface force must combine physical and cyber maneuver, enabled by exquisite tactical understanding of the local geography, the environmental factors in play, and the ambient players in the battle space. This is hard work at the operational level of war, as well as the tactical and we need to refresh the team on how to do this business. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Lastly, in addition to a distributed sensors and fires and distributed maneuver, we must distribute our cost. This requires a mix of high and low surface combatants. Modernizing our existing major surface combatants and fielding new platforms like DDG-1000, LCS, and the modified LCS. All these platforms will be needed to be able to contribute with advanced netted sensors, the needed fires, and the delivery of the right effects in the battle space. And we need to think carefully on what distributed cost means in terms of per round cost as well. The laser weapon system deployed in Ponce is already capable of producing per shot costs of less than a buck, and railguns should realize significant savings in terms of cost as well. Of course, these assets are moving the fuel and the kinetic power from the round to the power supply where it can be reused. Weapon diversity, just like spectrum diversity, will remain important and provide flexibility in terms of selecting a missile, a traditional projectile, directed energy, or a cyber effect to deliver the right effect in the right domain and at the right phase of the fight. We got to get that right in terms of cost. In the end, though, the emphasis is not just on the systems and the technology which continue to advance.
excuse me. In the end, though, the emphasis is not just on the systems and the technology, which continue to advance, both our own and our adversaries as well, but on our tactical genius and the manner in which we must operate our surface forces in a manner to be able to challenge potential foes across the battle space in all domains, to increase their physical, technical, and information challenges and risk while lowering our own, to give our surface warriors the tools to think tactically. Advanced sensors and systems can do only so much. Our tactical development must be founded on an understanding of the environment, again, the physical geography and the cyber domain, our adversary and ourselves, and employ that knowledge to seize the day. Tomorrow, SNA will benefit from Professor David Skaggs, who's going to present a Naval Heritage Program on the Battle of Lake Champlain. If you don't know this fight and understand what Thomas McDonough faced um, up off Plattsburgh, um, you won't really understand what I'm talking about here. Lieutenant Thomas McDonough was on leave and in Connecticut. We received orders from the Secretary of the Navy to proceed to Whitehall, New York, to build a fleet, man, train, and equip it. Take, take it to the north of the lake and defeat the British. If you know the details of the fleet, the soldiers that he converted to sailors in a few weeks' time, and his own capabilities, you will understand that he was outmanned, outclassed, outtrained, outgunned, outshipped in every sense of the word. But he went north, understood the geography, the prevailing wind conditions, and exercised his own really exquisite seamanship skills to put himself in position to win that fight in what was a horribly bloody uh, kinetic fight, to say the least, to use today's terms. Tomorrow, you'll understand what I'm talking about when we say tactics come from in here and is not here, rolling fizz green. And we're going to have to get smarter in the battle space in order to do that. Please, if you have the time tomorrow, take the opportunity to listen to Professor Skaggs presentation and understand what he's telling us. It's this that I believe we need to cultivate, our tactical and operational thinking through rigorous feedback, through understanding of historical examples like that, and by correcting our own training regimen in a way that's informative to the fleet. Okay, all that drags me back to Fleet Forces Command's priorities. How will I know if I'm getting this kind of tactical ingenuity and development? <clears throat> To many, this will be geeky fleet insider speak, even fleet headquarters insider speak. But as any operational commander knows, we can get to this level of understanding if our assessments processes work effectively. In Fleet Forces Command's case, that means in a way that helps to both improve upon and synchronize the relationship between the processes of generating the force, that is to say getting the fleet ready to be forward, and developing the force which is to say manning, training, and equipping it to be ready for what's coming in the future. That's the third part of my agenda at Fleet Forces Command, and that the, that's the part that will benefit most in our warfighting practices. If we do these three things, we can indeed say that the fleet is ready then to fight and win. Okay, I talked a lot, talked about a lot of things today. The importance of discussion and collaboration in all professional fora, industry, our naval surface warfare centers, the beltway, our classrooms, CICs on the waterfront and underway, the blogosphere, and of course the Surface Navy Association, the development of the between the ears matter that I'd referenced a moment ago. I talked to you about some of the successes that we had kind of across all domains in my time at Sixth Fleet, as well as the significant contributions and successes of your surface force around the globe. I also talked about my goals at Fleet Forces Command, to continue our current track, to see Admiral Gortney's initiative through, to develop our force to fight and win tomorrow, and to do this by closing the force generation development employment loops through a rigorous assessment-based process. And I also talked about my thoughts on advantaging the force with distributed lethality, by distributing our sensors and fires, by distributing our maneuver across all domains, and by distributing our costs. The challenges are significant, but I am greatly encouraged by the opportunity. Given the considerable intellectual capital evident here and in our ships, in our industry partners and technical community, in the training organization, 
and most importantly, in the mission success I see time and again across the surface force. Know this, the surface community is moving out together with these ideas. Okay, that's all I have to say today. Thank you again. Thank you again, Surface Navy Association, for inviting me here today. And thank you all, all of you, industry, civilians, and military here in this fora today for what you do in service to this great nation. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And if you wanted me to say what I thought the challenge was in, in the most concise fashion, that's it. You know, that is the fight we need to focus on. We have been operating forward in a relatively benign environment for 20 years. Okay, we've got a generation of warriors, not just surface warfare, uh, not just surface warfare officers, that have pretty much been at liberty to drive to any point on the ocean and deliver power projection fires forward without worrying much about defense. That is closing quickly, and we need to get that fall. And I need to get that inculcated into both the advanced training process, and then I need to get uh, a closed loop training warfare development process in place so that we affect basic training and advanced training overall. So that's, you know, that's kind of the next thing, okay? And then the third thing is we got to have force generation and force development talking to each other a little better. So we have some independent force generation models now ramping up. You know, one example is Fire Scout. You know, we keep Fire Scout forward. There's no rotational aft. We train the force just in time, and they're all forward all the time. There's nobody back here on the East Coast you know, that's flying a fire scout today to get ready to go on a mission. Um, it, it's happening just in time to send that forward. There are other sensors and systems we don't need a rotational force behind. It's going to be forward all, of, all the time. We have to close on the concepts for that, you know, how we do the fleet tactical development to make sure that we're getting the information here back to the fleet so operational level of war commanders know those things and make that happen. So when I talk about force generation and force development, Synchronizing those processes better, that's what I'm talking about. Those are some examples. Does that answer your question, Admiral? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Other questions? Please, I can't see you. Good afternoon, Admiral. Dave Hart on the Symposium Committee. Hello, Admiral. I'm curious if you can harken back, since you just left very recently duty as the commander of the Sixth Fleet. You talk about some of the challenges in the relatively condensed time you were there, yet a time of lots of activity. Uh -huh. Some of the highlights that you had to put up with have provided you some real great challenges. Uh, the Eastern Med challenge is as significant uh, an anti-axis area denial challenge as any we have in the world. Um, the Black Sea as well. Um, that problem evolved rapidly in time and required quite a bit of tactical thought. I can't get into it too much here um, because I go to a classified level that I'm not willing to, dis to discuss. Um, but there's a lot to be had there. And really, it's the, f it, it's the foundation of what I've talked about here in, in refining force employment and being ready to operate in these contested or denied environments. I have a mission to do, to do ballistic missile defense. The risks are going up to conduct that mission. Tactics need to help me mitigate those risks so that I can affect both the defense of allies and partners allies in the region um, and defend those ships so that they can continue that defense. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. 